Our ministry must become monotonous to people because, like Miss Hetzel said one time, Brother Waldfogel always says the same thing. Well, that was really a flattering remark because a um, preacher used to come here. He had been fired or laid off from his ministry, but he loved to carry his head very high, and he came here and expected to preach. And he said to me, Well, you hear me preach. I make a wonderful impression. I studied elocution. And so when I didn't let him preach, he said, I'll teach you how to preach. So he brought me his outlines. Well, I said, an old goat doesn't learn any new tricks, so you better keep your outlines. I'll stick to this one text that I'm so thankful that God has given us one text. Our sisters mentioned that verse where we read that he made known his ways to Moses. But then later on he says, but my people were none of my ways. And today it's the same thing. Wherever you go in the world, God would make known his way. And there's only one way Jesus Christ said to his disciples, I am the way. They wanted to know the way. And why didn't he say, well, you go to this seminary or go to that Bible school or read this book and there are all kinds, whole libraries full of books. Help yourself. Read philosophy, study psychiatry. He said, you'll never get there. I am the way and no man cometh to the Father but by me. And I'm so thankful that not only myself have had only one text, but our friend, whom we often quote, Mrs. Robinson, had but one message. And she said, and if I fail to let people see that one message, I have failed in my ministry. Beloved, you need Jesus. That was the one message. And oh, how it simplifies life. How very greatly it simplifies life. Let go and let God. Let him take over. We are his masterpiece if we let him have his way with us. And, of course, uh, some time ago when I took a trip, I got a letter from one of the darling saints here, a female saint. And she said, it's a good thing you're gone. When you come back, bring us some new illustrations. We're tired to hear the old one. Well, I saw that she needed the old one some more. <laughs> and this was my illustration that when I was learning the jewelry business, I had an awful time. I didn't know how to use my tools. I didn't know what to do with my gold. And I, I tried it. I had my design. I was to make a ring. And the more I filed and the more I soldered, the more I hammered, the more the thing looked like a cow instead of a ring. And I was so disgusted with myself. And I had a very bad boss. His voice sounded like the seven thunders of the apocalypse. And when he mentioned my name, he had a way of hollering at me from, the, from his office. Hunt! I got the, the shivers. Then I was petrified. But here I was working at my job, and suddenly I discovered and I felt the presence behind me. That's what Pentecost is. It's a presence. It isn't noise. It isn't silence. It's a presence. It's what Jesus says. It's good for you that I go away because I'm coming again. And then I will guide you into all truth. And here my boss stood behind me. And I didn't see him, but I could feel him. And he didn't say a word. 
He just breathed a little heavily. I knew that he was full of mercy and sympathy when he looked at my masterpiece. And not saying a word, he just shoved me off my seat. And he sat where I sat. That's what Jesus did for me, thank God. He sat where I sat. He took my place completely, but he shoved me off my seat first. Get off of there. And then he took my masterpiece in his hand, and then he picked out my files and my hammers and whatever tools I needed, and one, two, three, made such a change in my masterpiece. I saw that design coming into view. He was the master, and the master's hand on the job, and all I had to do was stand and pray. I didn't pray to him, but I prayed to the Lord. I prayed silently, oh God, don't let him quit now. Don't you let him quit. And you know, this is my confidence that he that hath begun a good work in you will also finish it. But he won't finish it if you monkey with it. You've got to leave it in his hands. That's what he means when he says, delight thyself also in the Lord. I was delighting myself in this boss that I was so afraid of because I knew that if he finished the job, it would be a masterpiece. I knew that. And so my, my prayer was answered. When that job was finished, it was a masterpiece. It was. And when my job is finished, it'll be a masterpiece that unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be made known the manifold wisdom of God. And what does God want? Why did he pick you up? Maybe you look more like a cow than a saint. I don't know. But look, you're calling brethren and sistering. <laughs> Not many mighty after the flesh. Not many wise. Not many noble. Or are you Baron von Winkhausen or somebody like that? God uh, can't do anything with people that know it all. He can't. And oh, that's what's the matter with us. We know it all. How we try to tell the Lord what to do. I said the other day, I have to smile at some people's prayers. What they don't tell the Lord and what they don't ask him to do. They might as well say, oh God, please. Let the water still be wet. Amen. That's what our prayers often amount to. But oh, when the Holy Ghost within you prays, he prays a prayer of confidence. I'm sure. I'm fully persuaded. Thank God. He that had begun a good work in me, he is on the job. And he can accomplish more in one minute. The Lord said that himself than I could think of in six hours. That's why I enter into rest. That's why my prayer is silent. Stillness. He has come to whom the praise of earth and heaven belong. My face I veil, my hands I raise, and silence is my song. But it isn't laziness. He works in me. He needs you. He needs your nothingness. He needs your weakness. He needs your defilement. He needs... He says that where sin abounded. Now, why did God pick out a man in whom sin abounded? Why? I'm his opportunity to show forth what grace can do. Their grace abounded much more mightily. Here's Brother Bowers. Many years ago, he made mention of a text that blessed me that time. He talked about, till Christ be formed in you. Till it is no longer you but Christ. And thereby I used an illustration too. I learned how to cast molds. The first thing I did as a kid was to make a nickel. And it was such a masterpiece that the kid next door spent it. <laughs> I didn't permit him to spend it, but he did. <laughs> you, in those days, you could get a hot dog sandwich for a nickel. 
or an ice cream soda. <laughs> you can't do that today anymore. And I made a nickel out of lead. <laughs> but I found out how to make it. First of all, I had to create a hole that was exactly the size of the nickel with the Indian on one side and uh, whatever was on the other side. Everything had to be perfect, but it was a hole. There was nothing there. It was a mold. And when you and I become poor in spirit because sin has become exceedingly sinful and we have capitulated and said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's a great big hole. Instead of purity, there's impurity. Instead of humility, there is pride. Instead of uh, love, there's hatred. There's a hole there. And now Jesus offers me his purity, his humility, his love. He says, let me be you. Let me come in. That's his opportunity. I was surprised one time when the Lord spoke to Elder Brooks. He was sick. <laughs> and he thought he was sick. And he thought he was going to have a breakdown. And then he went to the Lord and the Lord said, Why, Elder, this is your opportunity. Find out how perfectly himself took your infirmities. You and I are his opportunity. From head to foot, all the hairs you got on your head, if you got any left. Every part of your being, spirit, soul, and body, is his opportunity. And if I was born in weakness, he will be my strength. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Why don't I take him? One of the earliest experiences I had was when I had been here about two years. I had a breakdown. I was getting worse all the time. And since I had no pain, I thought this would be a nice way to roll right off the earth into heaven. I wasn't praying for healing, but the people were. <laughs> they didn't want me to die at that time. They used to love me in those days. And uh, so I went to the Lord about it. <laughs> and God gave me one word. He said, Jesus is your help. Walk out on that. I did. I suddenly saw that in this weak, sick body, there was help in the Holy Ghost. He that raised Christ from the dead has come to dwell in this body. Praise God, not to make it more sick, but to make it well. <laughs> I saw that in the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible's for. That's why God shows you his way. He says you will get there. Unless you let me be your way. Let me be your help. And a strange thing happened. I had gone home and gotten worse. <laughs> and uh, when the Lord spoke like that to me, I got right up and went right back to work. Rolled up my sleeves and went back to work. And there was no change in my body. I was still weak. But when I got up to preach, Christ got up to preach. That was strange to me. Then I had strength. And then I go back to bed for a little while only. But it was very wonderful. It didn't take long, a few days, until that strength had come fully. I think I've been a different person ever since. It seemed as if another man was standing up inside of me. There was. There was. Do you know that other man? Do you know the man, Christ Jesus? You know that he is the way, the truth, he is reality, he is holiness, he is righteousness, he is health for your body. And so you forgive me if I have only one message because I'm, in, I'm living in hope that we all get the hang of it one of these days. And oh, what will it be when we shall see him as he is, we begin to see him a little bit. The bride says she saw him through the Venetian blinds. She doesn't use that expression, but that's what she means. And then he was gone, but she said, oh, I won't give up. She went out on the street at midnight until she found him 
And when she had him, she wouldn't let him go. That's the message. You and I need not a lot of things about heaven, not a lot of things about power, not a lot of things about spirituality. We need Jesus. Delight thyself also in the Lord. You see these women driving a great big locomotive of a car. How do they do it? Well, they don't do it. The car drives itself. And so it is with Jesus. When you delight yourself in him, he, he takes care of everything. But you become subject. Sub, you become one with him. You're united to him. He is the head now. You're not the head anymore. He is the head, and you are a member of his body. He is the fullness, and you are the vessel. Oh, my Lord, you are the mold, and he is the gold. And I found out that when you have a mold like that, if there's the slightest imperfection there, nothing between my Lord and my soul, the slightest and even air, it's got to be let off. And even if there's a bubble of air there, your mold is spoiled. Oh, to be nothing, nothing, only to lie at his feet. An empty and broken vessel for the master's use made me. That's an awful message, to be nothing. One girl said to me, I want to be somebody. I hate to, I hate to hear all the time to be nothing. I want to be something. Well, she is. Now. And dumb as cameo. How restful to be nothing and to let him be all and in all. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we do love you. Oh, Jesus, and day by day you make us know this way more perfectly. How gracious, how straight, how perfect, how shining. It shines more and more to the perfect day. Oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, forgive me for not having always walked this way. My people was none of my way, but we do, Lord. We do, Lord. We do, Lord. We do, Lord. It's a wonderful way. Thank God. Thank God.